Welcome to tonight's lecture. My name is Desiree Genthner, a historian and someone who has made it their passion to be a voice for those who cannot tell their own stories. Tonight, we'll look at the colorful career of Mr. James Burroughs Jr. From his tenure in the Civil War to his entertaining main stage antics. As they say in the theater, break a leg. On April 16th, 1861, Abraham Lincoln issued a public declaration that an insurrection exists and called for 75,000 militia to stop the rebellion. Flyers typical for their time generated around Massachusetts towns stating that your communities were in danger. The typical get your blood boiling and leave you ready for a fight jargon was perfectly juxtaposed in bold faced letters in your local merchants windows. What else could you do but feel the desire to enlist? And the union would have needed all the help it could get because as a result of this call for volunteers, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee seceded from the Union in the following weeks. Now, James Burroughs, in his own recollection, and he is the gentleman that are we are here to learn about. Now, Wayne did allude to the fact that at the cemetery tour that I did last year, which was on Civil War veterans, I ended up coming across this gentleman. Now, he's not over in the Grove Hill Cemetery. However, he was linked to another individual who was on the tour. And you'll learn about that soon. James Burroughs just to introduce you in his own handwritten account. I was born at North Chelmsford, Mass, May 14th, 1842. My great grandfather and grandfather were both soldiers in the Civil War for Independence, being residents of Concord, Mass. When the struggle began, all of my forefathers had committed to a cause at one point in time in the family. Therefore, it is not to be wondered at that, I enlisted the moment I could find an opportunity. This occurred at Waltham, Mass in Company H, 16th Massachusetts Infantry. Burroughs was mustered in as a private June 29, 1861 at Cap Camp Cameron, North Cambridge. During the Civil War, North Cambridge was home to Camp Cameron. The barracks and encampment for the 1st Regiment of the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia, where recruits were housed and trained from 1861 to 1862. The camp extended for 140 acres, bounded by what is now Massachusetts Avenue, Clarendon Avenue, and Shea Road, extending up to what is now Holland Street in Somerville. It occupied the site of the present trolley bus barns and is now the Northview Condominiums Building. That's progress, folks. <laughs> the camp was named for Simon Cameron, President Lincoln's Secretary of War at the time, and Cameron Avenue was named for the camp. The uniform you see before you on the screen and if I could get a light on the front please and thank you just so you can see it a little bit better and maybe me too <laughs> thank you so this is James Burrow Jr's actual uniform. Let's step off the screen, folks. I apologize. You can still see it on here. The interesting details 
and that are striking to me is the quality. This is 1861. You're going to learn the story in just a moment, but it's pretty good condition. <laughs> pretty good condition, probably better than my blue jeans. All right. So as I alluded to, and I apologize folks on Zoom going off screen like that, going roundabout. 1926, this uniform is gifted to the society by James Widow. Within the text of the letter is great admiration and testament to the constitution of the Waltham women of 1861. The first 100 volunteers from the Waltham area were clothed at Camp Cameron by these uniforms, which were hand sewn by the women of the city. The pants are sewn to the coat. The type of material appears to be a woolen blend and the color is gray. We can assume that the fabric was from the Boston Manufacturing Company, which was a fully integrated textile mill. To create this labor of love, the women set up their base of operation at Rumford Hall. The Colonial Revival Style City Hall of Waltham was built in 1926 and opened and dedicated in 1927. It stands on the old site of Rumford Hall, a building constructed a century earlier in 1827 to house the Rumford Institute. The Institute was a lyceum with lectures and classes in the arts and sciences for the female mill workers at the Boston Manufacturing Company, which built the hall. While we do not know the names of the individuals who worked hard to craft the uniforms for the first 100 volunteers, Labor records do indicate that the women who worked at the Boston Manufacturing Company were between the ages of 16 and 24. It's merely a logical assumption to piece together the manufacturing company's role in the city, in addition to the mothers, sisters, and grandmothers who answered the call. In 1854, the Rumford building was sold to the town of Waltham for use as a town hall, eventually being replaced by the current structure. Now the buttons on the uniform read the mass volunteer militia. On the breast of the uniform, they're made of brass and were manufactured in Attleboro. The button manufacturer, r and Robinson Makers, was once the largest producer of metal buttons in the United States. And during the Civil War provided these militia buttons. Later, they would produce Union uniform buttons with the official insignia. Sadly, for the women at home, gray became the chosen color of the rebel army. And therefore, these uniforms could travel no further. Yet, for its ripe old age of 162 years, it's looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's hard to drive in the dark. <laughs> All right, the 16th Massachusetts Company H was a hardy bunch. Nowhere in published texts can I find a bad word about this group. I contemplated how to share this piece of Burroughs' journey. You see, historians have been accused of placing bias in their presentations. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> spinning history to meet one's benefit. However, when speaking about any war, you have the winners and losers and their perspectives on the matter are quite different. We speak of the glory of the battles and the righteous cause, but we can overlook the mere man. One of the most intriguing aspects of being a historian is trying to place yourself in the shoes of those whose story you wish to create. The detailed account in which James portrays and that I'm going to share with you 
I had to greatly condense. Are we to be spending an extra hour together tonight? I chose the bits that I felt showcased Mr. Burroughs' remarkable storytelling skills, and that would help you to understand the intricate details upon his memory. James' recollection was published in partnership with the Boston Journal in 1893, alongside other veterans in the entitled book, Stories of Our Soldiers. That which I am about to share with you informs the reader of the Battle of Chancellorville held in 1863. And the following year, the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, both of which were held in the same area of wilderness, merely a year apart. The Chancellorville conflict occurred between April 30th and May 6th, 1863 in Spotsylvania, Virginia. And it is considered to be the greatest military victory of General Robert E. Lee. Ironically enough, it was the last battle for General Stonewall Jackson as he was mortally wounded by friendly fire. Chancellorville is considered to be one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. And it was here that James was taken as POW enlisted as MIA. He was around 5,900 men who were listed as missing or captured from the Union Army. In his own words, I wish you could see the little handful of relics I placed upon my desk as I begin this soldier's story of an episode in the Great War for the Union. A button from the coat of my colonel, a little faded needle case with some of the same thread, pins and needles that were in it when the event I am about to describe occurred. A few mangled and misshapen bits of lead that once were bullets and sped on dreadful errands. Some harmless bits of paper that once held black grains of villainous saltpetre and did their share in making the place they came from famous in the annals of war. I promise you that we will not turn over many books together. You must look elsewhere for the history of the Battle of Spotsylvania. The one little book that I shall open is my pocket diary of 1864. And from its pages and from the storehouse of memory give you a truthful statement of my impressions concerning two hard days. May 12th, 1864. The second corpse charged a position in our front and took many prisoners and guns. The 16th hotly engaged and lost heavily. In Company H, Sergeant J. McNamee wounded. Also Privates E. Lane mortally and R. White slightly. Lieutenant Colonel Merriam killed. Matthew Donovan, Captain, severely wounded. I saw the Colonel buried the toughest battle of the war. Those are all the words the space permitted and were written at a time when I had seen nearly three years of service when my regiment was entitled to place the names of 12 engagements upon its colors in all but one of which I had participated. The almost sublime echoes of musketry in the wilderness were still ringing in my ears and the long windrows of that harvest of death wherever before my mental vision, and yet here at Spotsylvania was something that topped them all. 14 hours of steady fighting, a pitched battle along one narrow front, lasting from early morning until late at night. When the army moved away from the wilderness, my brigade did not go with the second corpse along the Brock Road, but down the Plank Road toward Chancellorville as a guard for the wagon trains. It was late at night and very dark when we came to the wilderness church, but I knew the place and my heart began to throb. For I was soon to pass the old house called Doodle's Tavern, where Melzy Chancellor had lived the year before and where I had found rude shelter as a wounded prisoner in the hands of the enemy after the Battle of Chancellorville. I left the ranks when we came near the house and running forward, pressed through the little hedge surrounding the garden and so into a rear room on the lower floor where I had seen so much misery and death after that unfortunate battle, I found the place uninhabited. The door is off the hinge and was quite startled when a large cow started to her feet as I entered the room. 
It was strange, creepy, quite the experience to stand there in the dark and try to people that house and grounds with the shadowy forms of 1,100 wounded boys in blue who came and went during the two weeks following the battle. I knew the orchard behind the house was filled with little mounds which I had seen grow in number day by day, but I had no sense of fear. They were all comrades of the grand old army, alive or dead. I had just a little time and stood for a moment in the corner that had once been my resting place and breathed a prayer of thankfulness for the mercy that had kept me alive in the midst of so many perils and then ran on to join my regiment. Pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This moment, which James has painted for the reader, it screams of PTSD, as well as the burden that had become such normality to soldiers like himself. He needed to go back to the location where he had cheated death and where he needed to find the strength to continue the job that had been placed upon him. I take this moment to state that out of the entire company, only six were ever listed as deserters. That should give you a strong indication of the character of this community. The Battle of Spotsylvania, which James is referring to post his imprisonment occurred the following year, May 8th through 21st, 1864. Historians will call this battle the inconclusive Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. It was the second major engagement in Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant's overland campaign, a major Union offensive to chase down Robert E. Lee, destroy his forces, and defeat the Confederacy. The battle took place over 12 days and cost 18,000 Union and 12,000 Confederate casualties. Union troops tried repeatedly but failed to break the Confederate line. Grant ultimately disengaged from the fight and ordered his men to continue their march south. Are we ready? Okay, we're going back to his words now. We bivouacked on the plain of Chancellorville that night and the next morning strolled through the woods where we had fought the year before and saw the whitened bones of our late comrades who lay as they fell unburied. I picked some Mayflowers from the spot where I had been left for dead on that battlefield. And they have never left their place in my little diary of 1864. You must know that in this portion of Virginia, the view is often broken by woods. Here, we had a forest on either side but the field in front spread out like a fan. Like as it neared the crest of the ridge. On the left, in front, the white walls of a farmhouse could be seen rising above the apple trees, the smoke lazily ascending from the chimneys and every aspect was of peace and quiet. The charm was suddenly broken by little puffs of smoke away up in the orchard and the angry whistle of bullets filling the air with deadly music. The soldiers near the woods on either side moved to the left and right, seeking the shelter of the forest. Those in the center kept on a few paces and finding the storm of bullets a little too severe, dropped down into the grass. The captain ordered the men forward. The men started to their feet and moved on until a comrade, Ezra Chapin of Waltham, the one that I mentioned that was on the cemetery tour, fell, shot through the breast and the arm. Then they stopped again, thinking that any further advance must partake of the nature of a charge. The wounded comrade was taken to the rear, thought to be dead. His knapsack, which was left behind was open and such of his simple effects as might be useful were taken by those who stood nearest to him in line. The sergeant who was by his side when he fell took a little needle case such as our old good grandmothers called a housewife 
and opening this, he found it filled with thread, buttons, pins, and needles. And on a little tag of cloth attached to the lining, he read Bunker Hill Ladies, Soldiers Relief Society. As the sergeant reclined there on the grass, the story of that old battle came back to him. He remembered what he had read about the desperate, ironed attack which the British troops made against his forefathers on that famous June day in 1775, and he felt that he and his comrades were about to be sent up against the enemy in much the same manner and with much the same results. As you might have guessed, the sergeant was James. Recalling the Battle of Bunker Hill in that moment saved his company from an all-out massacre. He was not in the habit of questioning his superior officer. However, he later recalls thanking God for the moment of insight and that their patience paid off. They were able to capture prisoners and learn that had they breached the crest of that hill, they would have met the gunfire of 400 Virginians. Unfortunately, this was but a reprieve. James speaks of the commanding officers and comrades who were lost in those 12 days. He shares how the memory sticks with him like a mental photograph and it never seems to fade. His own closing remarks of his recollections truly hit home. In my mind, that when you study this particular struggle, you owe small meed of praise to Grant, to Lee, to Hancock, nor to any of the lesser lights who are supposed to give it direction. For this splendid example of heroic valor, you, are indebted to the American volunteers on both sides. The men with knapsacks and guns, the patient willing pawns in that almighty combination, who shed their blood steadfast unto death while their leaders thought out the next move. Was James a proud soldier? Yes, he was very proud to have served the Union. His recollection of each soldier in his company, their interactions and the manner in which they died is a testament to his steadfastness to those friends. Those men were his family for three years. James was only 19 years old when he felt the call of duty. And if you put yourself back at 19 years old, those are pretty impressionable years. And he has now spent three years of his adulthood with this close-knit family. And he has watched several of them leave. James was not trying to glorify the battle or the generals who led. His is a remarkable retelling in honor of those who were his friends those who lived, those who died, so that you as the reader could better understand the common soldier. James had a flair with storytelling and a vast vocabulary, making his recollection not only personal, but entertaining enough to hold the reader's interest. A wonderful teaching tool that I myself was taught to utilize. No one pays attention to a dry tale, but when the tale is suddenly relatable, your focus is held. However, he wasn't ignorant to the fact that those who were running the game of chess were often ill-equipped. And it was the mere soldier whose life was lost during those moments of uncertainty in which course of action to take. We speak of being politically correct. These statements are direct. You owe small meed of praise to Grant to Lee, to Hancock, nor any of the lesser lights who were supposed to give it direction. And I'm honestly surprised that they weren't edited out of the journal. For this splendid example of heroic valor, you are indebted to the American volunteers on both sides. If anything, it definitely made the reader reevaluate the role of the soldier in both the Union and the Confederate armies, the willing pawns. James was one of 19 to return home from Company H. Less than a quarter 
remained of the original Waltham volunteers at the time of their mustering out in July, 1864. I myself am originally from a very small community. My graduating class was just a hair over a hundred. How different this community must have been at that time of mustering out with 13 battles under their belt and so few to return home. James couldn't immediately transition from the war effort after three years of fighting. Therefore, he joined the first US volunteer veterans until the close of the war. James was merely 22 years old when he returned to Massachusetts. And while he'd never fully leave behind the days of the soldier, he'd find a new career with a stage in which he could flourish. Congratulations, you are now cordially invited to attend the Bus Museum for a remarkable performance. But first, a brief history on the subject and one of its actors. When James left the service and returned to what could only be an attempt at normalcy, after the war, he returned to his childhood aspirations. You see, James had been starstruck before he had even seen a theater. When he was 14 years old, he had sent to New York for a dozen plays and the postmaster of his village had refused to deliver them into his hands until he had opened and examined them. Scandalous, said postmaster believed them to be unfit to be read and urged James to burn them at once. When he was 17, James came to Boston and began to write letters to managers asking for any position on the stage. He never did receive a response. And at 19, his career as a soldier had begun. Yet, upon arriving back in Massachusetts, James once again had the theater bug. This time, and with a new assault of letters upon the managers throughout the United States, he had better luck. A courteous reply from Mr. R.M. Field requested James to call at the Boston Museum on January 17th, 1866. The Boston Museum, also called the Boston Museum and Gallery of Fine Arts, was a theater, wax museum, natural history museum, zoo, and art museum on Tremont in Boston. Moses Kimball, an entrepreneur, politician, and associate of P.T. Barnum established the enterprise in 1841, and it remained open until 1903. It had two locations on Tremont. The first, as depicted in the drawing, which was open from 1841 to 1846. This was a quirky establishment, and I have been told that I am quirky myself, so I should know quirky. Kimball was smart, utilizing his knowledge of local law. He was able to provide customers with theatrical entertainment and still adhere to the strict Puritan laws. The museum's ground floor served as the exhibition hall, while the second floor was the portrait gallery, which could also be used as an auditorium containing mostly items from the purchase of the New England Museum, the exhibition hall displayed hundreds of paintings, engravings, watercolors, statuary, Chinese artifacts, and taxidermies of birds, elephants, and giraffes. The portrait gallery contained paintings of presidents, Massachusetts governors, clergymen, and naval commanders. Quite an exhibit. Later, the artifacts and theater moved down the street to accommodate its growing appreciation. James started out as a stagehand, and within a year, he proved that he was not only reliable in sewing together cloth sea waves and lowering them at the exact moment for a ship to set sail, but he could speak loud enough to be heard in the balcony. Thus sparked a 25 year career with the Boston Museum and a plethora of well-known productions.
It is now time to play. Hopefully we're still awake on Zoom and in the dark over here. All right, do you know your productions? These three well-known plays were all ones in which James had the good fortune to act in. I'll show you a few clues to help you sleuth and see if you can guess each of the three titles on today's show. All right, this is Shakespeare's longest play with its famous quote, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub, for in the sleep of death, what dreams may come. Should we do Jeopardy? Do, 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 do. Good job, it is Hamlet. All right. Nice job. So Hamlet was the first production James was cast in with a speaking role in 1866. He played the guard Francisco and later returned to the cast in 1886 as first player, traveling to New York to accompany Edwin Booth. Yes, folks, Edwin Booth. Older brother of John Wilkes Booth. Nice job. Booth's first theatrical performance was at the Boston Theater. He watched his father perform as the leading man in Richard III, and he was hooked. Edwin performed at the Boston Museum several times and asked for the stock company to accompany him at the New York Playhouse. Now, just a little side note here, but the history of the Booth family with Boston is really incredible. I highly recommend that if this is of interest to you with the Civil War, and especially with the Booth family, look into it. The playhouse that he put together, the place that um, Edwin was in, as well as the relationship with the city of Boston is really incredible. And you have to think to yourself too, what an interesting way of being able to mend because James had fought for the union and here he is acting with the, the brother who, well, perhaps ruined the Booth family name. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very interesting. Um, he performed with him a multiple number of times in other productions as well so and everything that I could find was very positive about Edwin saying that he was a remarkable entertainer and a very decent human being as well so he lived under that shadow though for the rest of his life um, as the Booth family name had really been scarred as a result all right round two this is the story about a good doctor who associates with a loathsome criminal. I suppose you could say that they knew each other well, as if they were one and the same. Nice, Jekyll and Hyde, perfect. After just two weeks of rehearsals, the play opened at the Boston Museum on May 9th, 1887. This was the first American adaptation of Stevenson's novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This adaption had been written in partnership with Richard Mansfield, a leading stage actor. Mansfield played the dual character of both Jekyll and Hyde. James was cast as the butler, Mr. Poole, and the play was well received. The following year, the production made its international debut at the Lyceum Theater in London. James accompanied Mansfield as Poole, accompanying him with his wife and their young son. He had actually met his wife on the stage and his son at the age of 12 months was held up high into the stands 
for a role and he was starstruck as a result and later became an actor himself. Now, uh, the unfortunate case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is that three days after they had opened at the Lyceum in August, 1888, tragedy struck in a strange series of coincidence that led Mr. Mansfield to not only be the, in the theater spotlight, but in the public eye for a more sinister reason. Perhaps you've heard of a little incident which took place in Whitechapel, revolving around the peculiar case of one dubbed as Jack the Ripper. Oh yes, I couldn't make this up if I tried. <laughs> So our Mr. Burroughs is in London at the very same time as the Whitechapel murders. If you'd like a visual, the theater was two and a half miles away from where Jack did his dirty work. Fascinating. However, the penny dreadfuls of the day began to post images such as these, creating doubt in people's minds. If Richard Mansfield himself had given in to his character and found that the stage could no longer satisfy him. By October, the production was canceled at the Lyceum. Mm -hmm. The company performed at other playhouses around England until January, 1889. Burroughs returned home to the Boston Museum while Mansfield's career and finances were severely impacted. That's showbiz. In all around, good. I can't tell the people on Zoom if you're still awake because your cameras are off and such, but that's okay. People here are still laughing though, mm -hmm. so. Alrighty, final rounds. The blank smell of success, once made by Nico in Massachusetts for nearly 150 years, this candy was the best-selling non-chocolate Valentine's Day candy. Yeah, or or more. So take the first, the blank. Yeah. So, uh huh. And sweetheart. Sweetheart. Good job. Good job. Sweetheart. This last production isn't produced today. However, its comedic and ironic nature is something that anyone of today would find relatable. Sweethearts is the classic tale where the childhood friend is about to enter the war. He declares his love for the girl, she fluffs him off, and doesn't immediately make it known that she feels the same way. It's called playing hard to get. So this art form, of course, can be lost on many. The two make a promise. There's an odd exchange of planting a sapling. And when he returns, he hopes she'll have her answer in a tree outside of her window to depict said answer. Now, let's jump 30 years. And they meet again. However, he has no recollection of the events. Ladies, even though he was there. And gentlemen, she swears it's true. <laughs> And she now has a tree planted in a most inconvenient spot, now blocking her window, and it's completely ruining the landscape. Yet, the reason why Sweethearts is a great play in James' career is not only because he had the audience laughing with his comedic supporting lines, but it was the leading man in the play, Jack Mason, whose acquaintance he had known. Mason worked with the Boston Museum for 12 years and later performed in every original Gilbert and Sullivan opera production in America. Perhaps the most intriguing thing that the stage actors of this period got to witness was the creation of silent pictures. Paramount Pictures dates back to 1912, known as the Famous Players Film Company. Founder Adolf Zukor, once an early investor in Nickelodeon's, recognized that movies appealed mainly to working class immigrants. Zucker planned to create feature length films that would appeal to the middle class by featuring leading theatrical players, 
By 1913, the company had completed five films. Its first director, with absolutely no film experience, was Cecil B. DeMille, who interestingly enough was born in Ashfield, Massachusetts. He was tasked with finding a suitable site in Hollywood. The place he found and rented, it was pretty luxurious, an old horse farm. Inside of the barn, perhaps the most distinguished film of his career was created. But it took quite a while though to come into rotation. And it was the 10 commandments with Charlton Heston. Jack Mason signed on with Paramount in 1915 and starred in five silent pictures between 1915 and 1918. The 22 stars in the original Paramount logo were said to have represented the first 22 actors and actresses that were originally contracted to work for the studio in 1916. So imagine all the things that James was to have seen and experienced in his lifetime. From his boyhood and feeling compelled to answer the union's call to his lively career on the stage. When the Boston Museum officially closed its doors in 1903, James had fulfilled 37 years off and on with the company. In 1915, he was in his 50th year of actual work on the stage and acted from time to time with stock companies where he resided in Lynn. James was the GAR historian at the Abraham Lincoln Post 11 out of Charleston. He never missed the opportunity to attend area veteran functions and was well known throughout the department of Massachusetts as a Memorial Day orator. While it might have been merely a coincidence that Waltham had been the closest place to enlist, James should be considered one of the original Waltham boys, a hearty group of young boys who grew up together during those three long years. Thank you for your service, Mr. Burroughs, and thank you for attending tonight's lecture. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and God bless. Thank you.